afternoon, everyone. I'm Ken Weinstein, and I'm proudly wearing two hats right now. Granted, they are invisible. The first is as president and CEO of Hudson Institute, and the second is as chairman of the Broadcasting Board of Governors. I want to welcome everyone to today's discussion. I, we have a very distinguished uh, audience here in attendance at the Stern Conference Room here at Hudson Institute. I also want to thank our viewers for tuning in to the live stream, both at Hudson.org and BBG.gov. Especially want to thank John Lansing, the CEO and director of the Broadcasting Board of Governors, for joining us today. John's going to be offering closing remarks in a, in a bit as we uh, wind things up. Obviously, this has been a critical time on Iran policy here in the U.S. and a critical time uh, in Iran with uh, uh, sweeping displays, public displays of discontent by Iranians, as well as numerous uh, regional security uh, challenges uh, in the region. And as the chairman of the Broadcasting Board, it's, this is an important conversation to have uh, in light of U.S. international media and in light of uh, changing U.S. policy. And I'm proud to say that uh, BBG Broadcasting into Iran is evolving to meet the needs and enable the voices of citizens within Iran and the Persian-speaking world uh, to communicate, to accomplish this with real-time coverage of key events and an investment in protected platforms to help Iranians access uh, critical information at this time. And I'm excited about the forward direction the BBG is taking to boost its impact and reach in Iran and uh, among the Persian diaspora across the globe. Reaching Persian speakers around the world helps dilute the reach of state-controlled media and counters the regime's narrative about the United States and our allies. As the ideological, economic, and political struggles in Iran are reflected in anti-government demonstrations and the ride of rising tide of voices of change, we now turn to look at how media, policy, and technology are shaping the country. And uh, I'm sure that the conversation that's going to follow is going to be dynamic. This is obviously an incredibly dynamic intersection factoring in global politics, unlike at uh, any other time in uh, modern history where technology, uh, geopolitics, uh, past and future intersect. I look forward to joining the conversation today, and I want to, again, thank uh, everyone for being here. I want to thank our uh, distinguished panelists, and I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us here at Hudson Institute. Great. Can we ask the panelists yeah. to uh, yeah. come up? All right, so thanks for the introduction, uh, Ken. I can't think, my name is Harun Ula, and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at the Broadcasting Board of Governors. And I couldn't be more excited to be with you here and with everybody that's uh, live streaming uh, all around the world uh, to talk about this subject. As Ken <coughs> said, I can't think of a more critical area in US foreign policy. And you have these trends. You have the trends explosion in media uh, with new platforms and you know younger and younger audiences. Um, not just in Iran, but all over the world, large diaspora populations. Um, you know, oftentimes, you know, people forget that Farsis are the top 10 most, in the top 10 of most spoken languages worldwide. So you have an incredible influential diaspora. And so we're going to talk about the intersection of all of that. And we couldn't have a better panel. Uh, we have Elon Berman and Mike Duran, um, really distinguished. And I want to make this, uh, we're going to try to make this very interactive and kind of a fireside chat. Elon is Senior Vice President at the American Foreign Policy Council, um, is, a, is, a, is a noted sort of expert uh, in, the, in the international arena, Middle East, um, has written quite a bit. Um, they, they do some of the best work uh, in town and uh, also teaches at Missouri State University. Mike Duran, uh, who's a senior fellow, many of you might know here at the Hudson Institute, uh, served in the White House uh, a few years ago, also is, um, was at Brookings. And my personal favorite, he's written a fantastic book, Ike's Gamble. You should all read it. Um, I'm almost finished. Um, it's a fantastic storytelling, all true, uh, about President Eisenhower. More important that they buy it. That's right. <laughs> Simon and Schuster. Make sure you get it. Um, so we're going to start with Ilana, sure. and then move on to Mike. But you know, love your thoughts on how important this area is, this intersection of media, technology, and foreign policy. Right, so thank you, first of all, and thanks, Haroon, and thank you to Ken and to Hudson for having this. I, I, I really do think that this is a critical moment to have this discussion. Um, the truism in politics is that you stand where you sit um, in terms of uh, how you look at an issue. So I have to start by saying, uh, by 
laying out and explaining what my particular slice of the pie and all this was. Um, about uh, a little over a year ago, uh, we, my institute, the American Foreign Policy Council, <clears throat> was approached by the Broadcasting Board of Governors to have this conversation. Uh, they said that uh, with the new administration, there's a new appetite for uh, reform and change and, and optimizing and upgrading the services and the nature of outreach towards Iran. Uh, and they asked us very kindly, uh, asked us to be an impartial third party to uh, sort of to curate uh, the overview, but also to take a look uh, from outside of the building um, at w what the problem was. And, and this actually, uh, it wasn't a, a, an immediate seamless transition. It's actually sparked a uh, several iterations in which I hammered out uh, points that I uh, felt very strongly about, um, that I got to choose my panel, uh, that, I, that we had independent third party translation, that we had folks who spoke Farsi who could watch uh, the footage, not just translate it, uh, not just read the transcripts. Uh, and the outcome of that was a, uh, about a half year project that uh, ended in October, November of last year, uh, which uh, synthesized a lot of the uh, analysis and a lot of the opinions that are, are my panelists, uh, the quartet of uh, panelists that I put together, uh, thought about Iran, what they saw, what they, uh, what they witnessed both on the airways and what they were reading uh, in terms of coverage. Um, and from that uh, came uh, both good and bad. Uh, the, we sort of, uh, for lack of a better explanation, we looked at this in terms of a conversation between sins of omission and sins of commission. Mm -hmm. uh, was this really a conversation about things that VOA Persian, uh, that Radio Farda was actively doing wrong all the time on purpose, or were there missed opportunities, uh, messaging opportunities towards Iran, where they think that they weren't doing that they should be doing? Uh, delighted to be able to report that we were, it was much more about sins of omission than sins of commission. Sins of commission are hard because they talk about uh, inherent bias and they talk about uh, things that need to be uh, rooted out, sort of root and branch. But we ended up at a position where we, we had the, the soapbox and we had the opportunity to articulate five or six uh, suggestions, uh, recommendations for how the Broadcasting Board of Governors as a whole could be more competitive in this environment. Uh, we talked a lot about how the journalism, uh, the US international media towards Iran needed to be less de minimis. We were seeing a lot of coverage that covered the news and it was just the facts. Uh, there wasn't really a lot of analysis. There wasn't really a lot of contextualization that is necessary as a shaping tool to explain why uh, this administration, why the last administration, why they liked certain things, why they didn't like certain things. Um, we saw uh, what appeared to be imbalances uh, in terms of opinions expressed on the airwaves, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of who was approached, what their views were on things like the Iran nuclear deal and other things. Um, and we. Um, the, I, I think probably the, the biggest criticism that we had was that the services didn't yet leverage their competitive advantage. Uh, we had a, uh, you know, we have institutions here in Washington uh, that give reporters uh, and uh, communicators access to the executive branch, access to, to the legislative branch, allows them to really delve in deep and explain the American system in a way that is very compelling and very uh, empowering for the Iranian audiences. And they really weren't doing that. And so uh, this report, which, uh, by the way, the, the summary is public. It's, uh, it's on the BBG website. You can look at it. You should read it. I think it's good. Um, <laughs> uh, was the, the macro message here was that the BBG, uh, in terms of Iran, needs to reform to compete. Because this is a competitive environment. It's competitive not only with the Iranian regime, which is messaging to this very same audience, mm -hmm. but it's also competitive because there are other people, other external actors that are messaging as well private channels like Minoto, uh, BBC Persian, things like that. Uh, and, and, what we, and you say this a lot, Harun. Uh, what we discovered is, is not that uh, Iranians won't watch American broadcasting. It's that Iranians won't watch bad American broadcasting. Mm -hmm. And so this, this study was done in a spirit of trying to optimize what we were doing. And it was urgent before. And the recommendations, I think, were urgent before uh, in terms of the time frame we were looking at, uh, what these recommendations could do in terms of shaping administration policy here in Washington. But it's exceedingly urgent now because of the ferment that we're seeing on the Iranian street, because we're seeing uh, a tremendous amount of activity, a tremendous amount of grassroots discontent that can be uh, communicated to, uh, empowered, uh, shared uh, in a way that I think could really further the American message 
uh, towards the Iranian people. So I was delighted to be able to do it, and I'm delighted that we that what the work that we did last year. It, this is the follow-on. We're, we're able to sort of to transition the conversation forward. Excellent. Well, and we're going to get into more of the sort of in some of the particulars of some of the things you did and some of the pivots of the, you know, what we've sort of seen in the market landscape. Um, I should also note that we, um, there's no cards in the back for questions. If questions pop up for any of us, um, and also those that are live stream, you can tweet us at bbg.gov. Um, so all, well, all, all questions welcome, and, and hard ones, especially for Mike. Uh, so Mike, so take us a little bit 60,000 foot. So Ilan was talking about the media landscape. Um, tell us where things stand now from a policy perspective, and then we'll blend it back into thinking about this new technology media sphere. Well, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, and thanks for the nice things you said about my book. I especially appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me start from, uh, uh, with Elon's comment that we should be messaging to the, the, to the discontent. Um, and I'll just talk around that. I, it's a problem, I think, and uh, I'll talk around the problem. One of the problems is there's an ambiguity today in our policy, uh, I, th I think, in the, in the Trump administration's policy. Um, and I, it, I think you can get at the ambiguity with the question, are, are, are we pursuing a behavior change or a regime change policy uh, toward Iran? Um, and I, I think the, um, the answer, if, if you ask uh, the Iranians, uh, or even though I think a lot of our European allies today, they'll say it's a regime change policy, and they'll say, look at the 12 points that Secretary Pompeo um, uh, laid out in his speech uh, recently, and what's the chance that the Iranian regime would ever meet those 12 conditions, you know, get all of your troops out of Syria, uh, basically give up your, your nuclear program, uh, or, or at least uh, uh, make much greater concessions than have ever been envisioned before. Um, <clears throat> at least since the Obama administration began negotiating with it, and so on and so forth, and you can't imagine that happening without the, without the, um, w with this regime in place. But the explicit statement from the secretary is that we want a deal, and we want we want to welcome you back into the family of nations. We want to welcome you as this regime back in the family of nations. If you'll just do, you know, meet these the following uh, requirements. Um, and as a message to the people who are in the streets, uh, uh, striking the, to the strikers who are in, in, the, in the streets now, and the people who are protesting, it's unclear where American policy stands. And I think the broadcasting is, uh, you know, is going to have to um, um, is going to have to confront in one way or another that um, that ambiguity. Another problem that we have I mean, is that the, the fact of the matter is the, the Iranians. Uh, the Iranian regime is much better at syncing up message to action than than we are, mm -hmm. uh, and they're 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 much more adept than than, than we are. It, it's um, partly a result of being uh, the smaller and and the weaker power. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're uh, it's partly being in the Middle East and not and 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 us being distant from it. So. Um, we're we are not <clears throat> we're not particularly good at judging the way our statements and actions um, influence the perception of Middle Easterners about who's on top and who's not. I mean, in the Middle East, it's it's all a game of who whom. You know, who's dominating whom, uh, and all the Middle Eastern actors are intensely aware of that, and everything they say and do is designed to make it look like they're stronger than they are. They all feel incredibly vulnerable, and, uh, uh, but they're all, they're all putting up a big front. Mm -hmm. We never put up a big front. You know, it's, uh, it's funny. We have so much more power, but we don't, uh, we don't put up the front in, the, uh, in that way, and it works to our disadvantage a lot. But I, you know, I noticed in, back when I, I used to work in the White House, as you mentioned, in the, in the Bush administration, and I followed this issue very, very closely. And the Iranians when they had a major policy, like say negotiating with us, before they would go and negotiate with us, they would first of all send a delegation to Syria to, uh, they were gonna negotiate with us about Iraq. Here's a good example. The, uh, and we, we put an, out an invitation to them. They sent a delegation to Syria and they talked to the, the regime of Bashar al-Assad and they said, we're gonna negotiate with the Americans about everything. 
which was not true. And we want to we want to present your issues as best as possible. So let's let's have a whole, so they orchestrate this whole fanciful discussion with the Syrians about how they're going to represent Syrian interests to, to the United States, thereby elevating themselves up as the as the equal of the United States in discussing the whole uh, the whole region. At the same time, they had a a rumor mill in Lebanon, and they started putting out rumors that uh, that the that we the United States was going to make concessions at the expense. Um, uh, uh, of our allies in, 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 in uh, March 14th in Lebanon to, to the advantage of Hezbollah. And then they would, and then they would send their, their Arab language television reporters to Iraq, and they would interview Iraqis on the, on the ground who are obviously it's totally scripted, but it doesn't look like it. So, and all this, is, all, all this is synced up. And it just imagine an American, pol- an American communications policy in which you had diplomacy and communications and, and intelligence operations and all, all synced up to create the impression that you're much more powerful than you, than, than you actually are. It's, it's, totally un, it's, it's totally unthinkable. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll never get to that because we're not a dictatorship and because we do have all these competing elements in our government. But we can do a lot better. And I've gone on along, I'll just make one point. Elon's, the, in the report that he mentioned, one of the things that they, that they highlighted, which I, was that, was that was that the reporting needs to focus more on the foreign policy of uh, of, of the regime? I totally I, I, I totally agree in the sense that that that's a, a good thing to do because we know the people that if we're messaging to the discontent on the street, the people are uh, the people uh, are asking how come all of these resources are going to to Hamas and to Hezbollah and to um, and to Bashar al-Assad and uh, and so on and so on, and not to and 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 not to us. Mm-hmm. So, but the regime is not going to go. The regime is not going to discuss that, right. and we don't discuss it. We we the U.S. government doesn't. We, uh, uh, you know, as we those of us who are interested in this topic, we we need to we need to constantly push the military and the intelligence community. To put out information, the things that it knows about what Iran is doing that the average Iranian doesn't know, and would and it would be it would be inflammatory to the average Iranian. We are, uh, you know, every every the, you know, CENTCOM commander always has his list of intelligence priorities, and like the number three priority is always intel support to strategic communications. But if it's number three, it doesn't get done, is what it, is what it means. We need, it needs to be more than just the CENTCOM commander. As a government, we need to spend time, time thinking about how we get out the enormous amounts of information that we have about corruption, but also about what, just what they're doing in the region. Yeah. So a couple of really good points I want to build on that um, and, and turn to you, Lon. I mean, as somebody, as I follow the Farsi language, uh, you know, language space, I mean, I'm, I, you know, it's really remarkable, I think, when you think about um, what, and as you, as you looked at in the report, what Voice America and Radio Free Europe have done. I mean, I mean incredible reach, about 25 percent, almost a little under 25 percent, a weekly audience in Iran. Um, in terms of the key audience segmentation, is very high among urban youth. Um, you know, there's, you find uh, not just Iranians there, but all over the world sort of accessing content, um, and you find new, uh, on new platforms. And so sort of talking about what Mike said about audience sort of thinking about messaging and formats, um, what have you seen in terms of, as you've seen the protests that came, up, came through, and, and how do you see that sort of changing in terms of those trends? So I think that's a, that's a key point. Um, I, I would actually start by making a strange American analogy. Right? I think about this uh, using the Willie Sutton rule. Um, do you guys know who Willie Sutton is? Uh, right, so the famous American bank robber who uh, engaged in a decade-long spree uh, throughout the Midwest. When he was caught by uh, US law enforcement authorities, he was asked why he robbed banks. And the answer was, well, because that's where the money is. So we need to go, in terms of communication, where the money is. Right? We need to follow the Willie Sutton rule. And if you look at Iran, uh, Iran is uh, organically very different in terms of the media landscape than other countries, uh, other near peers uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and a lot of it, by the way, has to do with uh, technologically dynamic environment, a digital environment, mm-hmm. but a digital environment that's changing. And if you go back and you look at what the Iranian regime did in the immediate aftermath of the summer 2009 protests, uh, where you saw millions of Iranian <laughs> Uh, who were using social media, uh, different platforms, to organize, to coordinate in their opposition to the regime, uh, this was a teachable moment for uh, Iran's clerical elite. 
And so the months that followed saw the regime uh, migrate onto the internet mm -hmm. and throttle the protests there, and they've remained there. So everything that you've seen from Iran, uh, from their discussions of this partially formed idea of a national in halal internet, uh, mm -hmm. so they don't have to access the World Wide Web, all the way to uh, bans, uh, selective bans on social messaging apps like Telegram. Uh, that's all of a piece. It's all part of that discussion. Because the Iranian regime understands very well mm -hmm. the dynamism of this environment, the fact that Iran is one of the uh, most wired nations uh, in the Middle East. And they're trying to get ahead of this decision cycle. Mm -hmm. And that creates a challenge for all of us, but especially for the BBG and, and, and for the uh, organs of US international media in terms of trying to optimize that reach, trying to access uh, in a constrained environment, trying to access that audience. Right. Um, I want to pull in Sitar Sikh, who's our who's our director of our Persian News Network, and I have to say, you know, we go back to the protests that were happened a few months ago that were so integral in terms of citizen voices. As as for those of us who have traveled in Iran or have studied the language market, the protests started in Mashhad and Qom and and some of the more traditional sort of areas where you wouldn't have thought the protest started. And you know, Voice America had a team 24/7 covering empowering citizen voices, and ranked actually top five globally. Um, so I want to show a quick. Uh, I'm going to tee it up uh, with a quick video, and then and a real credit to um, the team that that Sitar has put together because they are doing what you talked about in terms of uh, you know criminalizing the IRGC and thinking about getting out the voices from on the ground because that's that's to me has to be authentic. It has to be organic. In late 2017, thousands of Iranians took to the streets to protest economic and political difficulties. It wasn't long before the government did what it usually does, try to silence the protesters and limit the spread of information about the demonstrations. So Iranians did what they normally do, turned to the U.S. global media networks for accurate, fact-based, and uncensored reporting. For decades, Iranians have counted on the Voice of America and Radio Farda for local, national, and international news and information. Today, nearly one quarter of the Iranian adult population consumes BBG content on a weekly basis. That's 14.3 million people on just about every platform, from shortwave radio to encrypted mobile apps and everything in between. Voice of America provides in-depth coverage of U.S. and international developments, and it remains the U.S. government's only means of direct communication with the people of Iran. Radio Farda's programming acts as a surrogate, providing 24-7 radio programs and daily TV newscasts that fully cover developments within Iran and the region. Information that is often censored by the government, but that is vital to the everyday lives of its citizens. When, as it often does, the government tries to control information by jamming TV and radio signals or putting restrictions on the internet, the BBG steps in and provides circumvention tools. This technology enables Iranians to bypass government censorship and get to the truth. And the tools the BBG supports are among the most popular in Iran. It is a critical time for the people of Iran Domestic and international politics weigh heavily on their daily lives, and decisions are being made that affect their future. The BBG believes they should be informed, engaged, and connected so that they can make the best decisions for themselves. So one thing I want to sort of uh, ask Sitara to expand on, because you, better than most, understand what's going on in the media environment and sort of how to empower those citizen voices. And by the way, I should make a plug. Sitar did a fantastic uh, interview with Secretary Pompeo uh, this past weekend. Everybody should go check it out. Great interview with the Secretary, and the Secretary was very eloquent in sort of laying out the position uh, right now in terms of a roadmap. So, Sitar, if we can get her a microphone to tell, I want you to see if you can respond a little bit to what Mike and Ilana brought up, both in terms of messaging opportunities, but also some of these trends in the market. Well, all I can um, thank you very much, Ilan, by the way, about the review. We take it very seriously, and it's been extremely helpful. And thank you for your testimony uh, on the Hill about what you said about uh, the um, Iran being close to what we're doing with the Soviet Union, and that's important also. And we'll see whether the trend with Telegram is showing what they are doing. 
So I just want to continue on what Elon was saying. Um, all I can add is that, um, as far as the media environment is concerned, uh, the Freedom Forum and Reporter Without Borders also show that Iran continues to be uh, a country that is not free. Freedom Forum ranks Iran in its uh, 2018 annual report as a country that is in the same category as Belarus and also maybe just a notch above North Korea. And Reporters Without Borders still uh, is uh, designating Iran in its 2018 report as a country that is at the bottom of the list and as among one of the most oppressive countries. But there is one trend, so the trend is pretty much the same. It has continued in the last several years. But there is one new development that I think is worth mentioning, and that is that Iran is becoming more aggressive in its pushback against what we do and against Western media in general, and specifically uh, on um, digital uh, new media platforms. Mm -hmm. What we saw in January, for instance, when the, at the height of the um, protest that the Voice of America covered along with all the uh, Western media, we saw that the government blocked Telegram and Instagram. Telegram, as you mentioned, Elon, is one of the most or the most popular messaging app in Iran. For 12 days, they blocked that. And uh, the protests are continuing as we speak. They're sporadic, but they're around the country. Uh, but in mid-April, what happened is that the Iranian supreme leader went after Telegram directly. And the reason is that there are 40 million users of Telegram, or there were 40 million users of Telegram in Iran. There were politicians, there were companies, uh, there were the state um, agencies, but there were ordinary citizens in Iran. And that's close to half of the population of the country. And um, it was only in April, in mid-April, that the government banned the use of Telegram in universities, schools, state agencies, and different media. And it's only then that the supreme leader and the Iranian president, the so-called reformist Iranian president, they close their accounts. And that is telling also, it's a side note just on the Iranian president who likes to show himself as someone who is supportive of social media. He not only did not open Twitter and Facebook, but he also was the first to go after Telegram. And then about four weeks ago, a court just ordered Telegram to be shut down completely and blocked in Iran. So what is important for Iranians, I think, the only way that they can get to social media, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, and um, other social media platforms, is through VPN. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is what we are trying to do also, virtual private networks. And it's a sort of a game of cat and mouse between the um, Islamic Republic and the people of Iran. And it continues, and I think at this particular juncture, it is important, and it underscores that the work that John and the um, BBG team of circumvention, they are doing in developing and uh, in uh, updating the um, censorship or anti-censorship tools uh, to um, defeat the firewall of the regime. But this is the trend that we are seeing, and it's not only us, and I can expand later on, but it's other Persian-speaking media. Great. Thanks, Sitara. Mike, I want you to see if you could respond a little bit to what Sitara said. But you, you know, you had sort of, you'd mentioned about syncing up um, actions with sort of messaging. And, and also, and what Sitara is also talking about is a competitive landscape. That there's, you know, that the, Iran, that the Saudis are now funding a channel uh, to go after Farsi-speaking audiences. There's others in this crowded information marketplace. Um, what's the best way to do that? Well, you, I mean, you guys have, uh, you have, you have a tough role um, because of what I said before, I think the ambiguities of the, of, of, of the policy. What, what I see with the, the Trump administration is that we have some marvelous, from my perspective, uh, some marvelous actions, but there's a gap between, uh, between stated goals, uh, aspirations, and and the means to and, and the means to achieve them, mm -hmm. uh, I I'm not I'm not as I'm not at all dispirited by the uh, by the existence of this gap, but I think it needs to be closed. 
um, and and it it presents a problem for um, for the for the kind of messaging that I that I personally would would like would would like to see. I mean, you guys have the rules by which you're gonna um, you're gonna operate. Mm -hmm. I I would like to see the I would like to see us have clear policies about rather than just the occasional statement about the uh, the needs of the Iranian people, the oppression of the Iranian people. Um, I'd like to see clear policies about supporting the Iranian people, clear definition of, of, uh, uh, of things that we, changes, specific changes that we would like to see, um, uh, and so forth. I like, so there's support for, uh, support for democracy and support for rule of law and opposition to, uh, um, opposition to corruption and fraud and so on, all of that. Uh, but then I'd also like to see the, the, the gap between ways and means filled by policies with respect to, you know, Secretary Pompeo said he wants no Iranian soldiers in Syria. Right? It's, it's Iran should be, Syria should be completely free of, of Iranians. How are we going to achieve that? Uh, so in terms of sending a message to the, to, the, to the Iranian people in the absence of a clear policy, that, that, or, or at least indications of how that might of how that might happen, it's hard to send a message to the people that are out protesting in the street that that is really imminent in 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 in, in any way. I don't think there's a, in in my view, I don't think there's a clever messaging. So th this is a the, the the messaging challenge and the messaging problem is a policy problem, mm -hmm. not a communi not not a communications problem. There's only there's only so much you can do with clever communications to send a message in the absence of a, a of, of of a clear policy backing it up that's that is my having worked directly in this area in government that was that was my big takeaway mm -hmm. there's a lot of talk about strategic communications that disconnects it from policy whereas policy really is the uh, policy is the, the the key factor and you need it it really requires somebody in the white house who understands the importance of strategic communication and is working in all the time in all the major policy discussions saying hey okay we want to do x y and z how do we what what's the communications dimension of this what can we do to what, what can we do to give you guys the tools you need to to have a greater impact so Elon, just building on what Mike said, you know, you've written a lot about IRGC. He's talking about this sort of this this potential gap. Um, you know, one thing that Sitar pointed out is that you know in, our, in U.S. international media we have very high trust. So when you talk about impact, our viewers uh, that consume our content, um, you know, the millions of Iranians, almost 14 million inside Iran, and millions in terms of the diaspora community, they actually. Um, trust our content not only to share it at very high rates, 70 to 80 percent, um, but they actually it compels them to action. So, building on what Mike said, you know, what, you know, how, how do you sort of, how do you, is there, are there other things that can be done as a roadmap around the IRGC or thinking about diaspora uh, you know, communities around the world? Sure. And I actually think, um, so I, I would uh, sort of slice this pie uh, slightly differently than Mike does because I think he's absolutely right. I, I think you need a, a top line policy clarity of vision about what you want to achieve. But I would argue that in the absence of that, and you know, let's be clear, right now we, we don't have that clarity of vision, um, the Broadcasting Board of Governors actually does have something that, uh, as we say, is close enough for government work, right? Which is the mission to, uh, to do reporting in support of freedom and democracy, right? Which gives you key points to focus on in your coverage, right? One of the biggest criticisms that we had in our report was that more often than not, the journalism that we saw going into Iran was de minimis. It was journalism. It was just the facts, ma'am. It wasn't, uh, it really didn't talk about uh, the broader implications about Iran's electoral process being more selection than election, for example. Uh, it wasn't a conversation about uh, the Supreme Leader's uh, accounts that are squirreled away in the Caymans or, or in the Nordic countries or wherever. Um, but all of these things can be discussed, they can be broadcast, they can be activated as a way of promoting the BBG message of supporting freedom and democracy and, and transparency. Um, and here I would say that there's a couple of things that I think we need to watch for. You know, the first is US engagement. Uh, communication can't be an afterthought, right. Uh, right? So we see this in administration after administration after administration. Uh, you do not get top level officials saying what they have to say to 
foreign audiences in order to animate them, empower them in a way that would be constructive for American strategic objectives. Um, you certainly didn't see that. Uh, I, I would argue you didn't see that much uh, during the Bush administration. You really didn't see that during the Obama administration at all, uh, in part because the Obama administration was focused uh, much more on official engagement with the regime and, and, and far less so with, uh, on engagement with the people. I think that's beginning to change, and that's a very, very much a good thing. The interview that Cetera did with uh, Secretary Pompeo, the level of access that VOA got uh, during the protests earlier this year uh, to the then National Security Advisor, uh, H.R. McMaster, and to other high-level officials, uh, suggests that this administration gets it uh, in terms of being able to message. But consistency is key. And so what we need here is not just top-level engagement mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. We need top-level engagement all the time. And we need the U.S. government to say and engage uh, with the Iranian people in a consistent fashion. And if they don't have a coherent policy to articulate, they can certainly articulate where they think their regime is going wrong, right? Which is, which is uh, a, a, not, not an equal, but at least a, a feasible substitute. And the other thing is uh, technology, right? Mm -hmm. So as we discussed, uh, the Iranian regime has become very adept at altering uh, the digital landscape, at right. constraining the digital landscape. Uh, VPNs are certainly part of the uh, part of the conversation. I would say that there's there are other things uh, that we can do in terms of looking at proxy uh, internet service providers in countries that are adjoining Iran, uh, for example, that would allow uh, uh, people, audiences that are in coastal regions that would allow them greater access. But this sort of creative thinking is precisely what's needed because as you move into a more constrained constrained digital environment. It's not just enough to have communications coming from the United States. The communication has to be adept enough and agile enough to sort of to break through all of those firewalls that the Iranian regime is throwing up, mm -hmm. and for very good reason. That's a great point. Um, you know, building on what Sitara said, and you, you talked about circumvention technology. I mean, the Iranian telecom providers are shutting, they are using every means to sort of access and to censor information. And, and some of our work and others, but our Office of Internet Freedom, you know, at the height of the protests, I think 800,000 users were using our technology to access uh, not only our content, but able to access accurate, independent uh, reporting. So, so it's exactly that, right? So that to me, this digital landscape, the digital sphere has now become, that is the arena with which they're putting all this energy, right, uh, to go against. Um, speaking of different platforms, I want to ask, ask Martin here to, to honor us, who's from Radio Free Europe. You know, I was out in Prague not too long ago, and they take in, they have call-in shows, they have a number of different programming, bringing in voices from the region. Our radio penetration is very high, um, and it's, it's important for a lot of people that, that, that are unable to access it otherwise. So Martin, can you say a little bit about what Elon was mentioning in terms of these opportunities and these new audiences? Absolutely, no. Um, one of the important things that's going on right now in the way that BBG networks are reaching into Iran is the diversity of ways that we're doing it using radio, using TV, using the internet, using all the social media, making circumvention as easy as possible for people to use by integrating that into some of the tools that they use to be able to get in. By doing that, you're reinforcing your message across platforms and building trust that much higher in the messages that you are putting into the country and in the communication that you're having with these people. Um, uh, uh, last year, uh, in 2017, the surveying that we did showed that uh, Radio Farda's reach into the country was very even across all of these platforms and showed that those people who would use um, multiple platforms to be able to pick up Radio Farda content would have their trust be built up even higher than if they were just in general listening to the content. Hearing it from different, different angles is a, is a very big advantage. Um, even now, even with all the obstacles that the uh, regime is putting up for people to, uh, to be able to reach this content. Every month in 2018, we've been getting 20 million um, live listens to Radio Free Europe, Radio, uh, Radio Farda online content, online, online audio. Uh, that's a tremendous number. And it's an increase over what was happening last year. And I think that's tie that ties back directly to all of the ferment going on in the country, all of the economic pressures that people are feeling, all of the issues that they're having with the regime and with, uh, with what's going on policy-wise. Um, more than 2.1 million Facebook followers. 
uh, Facebook, even with all the obstacles, is still a major way, major means for people to communicate. And of this two million, about the same number of people are engaged with the content that FARDA is producing on this platform. Um, you know, so it's a tremendous you know, building up these kinds of technological platforms to be able to bring a credible, honest, well-researched, well-verified um, message and set of news, set of analysis to the audience is, is, a, is a tremendous advantage that BBG uh, platforms have, and it's a tremendous tool in the arsenal that this country has to be able to interact in a, in a responsible way with Iran. So Mike, you know, Martin brings up a couple of points, which reminds me of the, that Iran's running its largest current account deficit uh, in recent memory, and the, the conditions on the ground are pretty dynamic. Uh, not just in the information landscape in terms of how people are consuming information, but you have a lot of internal, uh, uh, a lot of um, moving pieces. It's hard to say, but let's say a year from now, um, you know, what does the region look like? Uh, you know, if we're thinking a year from now, we're sitting here and having a conversation. Um, you've seen the, the, the long history of sort of the last few years. What do you think? What do you think the trends are pointing towards? It, I, I, the, the simple answer is, of course, I don't know, and I think the greatest variable is is U.S. policy uh, and filling in some of those gaps that I'm. There's a, there's a clearly when when Donald Trump when Donald Trump um, uh, pulled out of the the JCPOA he initiated a um, clearly and explicitly a a competition with the Iranian regime and that competition is going to go on in a number of arenas I hope we find out that in each arena the United States has has uh, has uh, is achieved dominance or on the way to dominance. But a couple really stand out. Um, and there's in this contest with the with the Iranians, there's there's the question of what's actually happened and how it's perceived. Right. And <clears throat> you know I think that we have historically tended to perceive the Iranian regime as stronger than it is. And I don't mean to say for a second that it isn't a that it isn't a very significant enemy, and, and we shouldn't we shouldn't uh, uh, we shouldn't um, uh, exaggerate our own strength and our own ability. But we have a tendency all the time to sell our to sell ourselves short, our own power and influence, and to um, and to take their front that they put on as 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 who they really are. But one arena is us and the Europeans, because the Europeans are 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 clearly. Um, uh, you know, on the spectrum from very annoyed to enraged about the the decision of the president, uh, and they're going to work to they're going to work to block some of the U.S. some of the U.S. sanctions, and of course the Iranians are going to are going to work to to present that the the gap between us and the Europeans as incredibly significant and working to the advantage of the um, uh, of the regime. So it's our job. Uh, it's our job to make sure that the the net result of the uh, of the reimposition of sanctions is is really debilitating to the regime, and that the people that the people of Iran know that, and they understand. This is where the messaging becomes so crucial that they understand the 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 damage to the Iranian economy is the result of choices taken by the regime. And not by and, and and not by Donald Trump. That the regime has decided to maximize to 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 um, prioritize Hezbollah and Hamas and the nuclear program over the needs of the um, uh, of the Iranian people. And the the competition for getting that message through is 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 going to be is going to be heated now or more difficult than even before. We never, by the way, we never got that message through very well. But it's going to be harder now, not just because of the media landscape that you mentioned, but also because there are going to be significant voices in the West among our allies who are going to be saying things that are going to reinforce the regime message. So that's a that's a tough one. And you know, there are other areas of you know, Syria is an area of competition, and Iraq. Right now, the the competition is over is going to be over the. the uh, Muqtada Sadr, and is Sadr going to be is Sadr going to be pulled toward the United States and Saudi Arabia? Is going to be pulled toward Iran? And are we going to be able to build a build a uh, an, an Iraqi defense forces that are that are somewhat 
that are out from under the thumb of the, of the Iranians. And how all that's going to play out, I, I don't know. But I hope that in each, in each landscape, we're sending a message to the Iranian people in particular that, that, and to the people of the Middle East in general that, that Iranian power is on the decline mm -hmm. and that the suffering of the Iranian people is a result of the choices that their regime has made. Can I, can I jump in there for a second? Because I actually I want to uh, sort of drill down a little bit on, on what Mike said, because I actually think that this is a, a very useful way to think about this. This is a competitive environment. We're in a strategic competition uh, with Iran, and not just in a military context, but also in the realm of ideas, in the, in the realm of media. And so just focusing on that for a second, uh, I think you could point out that, so it, let us posit that Iran has a very well-resourced and well-developed media strategy. It's not a media strategy just to message and constrain its domestic environment, but it's also uh, a media strategy to promote its foreign policy objectives abroad. And so America's challenge is twofold. It's not just to penetrate the increasingly sophisticated barriers that Iran has thrown up around its own population. It's also to compete with Iranian ideas abroad as they're being telegraphed by outlets like Press TV, by outlets like Hispan TV, by outlets like IRIB, and to constituencies that we're not messaging to now. Um, a great example would be uh, you know, what Iran is trying to do in terms of uh, amassing grassroots support among uh, constituents, frankly, that uh, don't know much about Iran at all in the Americas through Hispan TV, through its dedicated bureau in, in Bolivia, uh, to communicate to uh, audiences that don't necessarily know what Iran is all about. Uh, we haven't really given serious thought to a countervailing argument that explains why Iran is dangerous to those audiences, right? We're focused very much on penetrating the, uh, what President Obama called back in uh, 2011, the electronic curtain that has descended over Iran. That's a laudable goal. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that absolutely should be fully resourced. But we should also be thinking a little bit broader. Uh, not only what Iran is trying to do at home, but also what Iran is trying to do abroad. You know, one, one important thing that you, you, you've highlighted uh, you know, Elon, is that there's this move to, we have to move out of this idea of thinking about a country-based policy moving to our language-based strategy, right? Because as you mentioned, whether it's in Bolivia or in Jakarta or in the Gulf or in Europe, you have large now diaspora communities. You have those that not only speak as native language, Farsi, but second or third languages. People forget whether in Afghanistan or in Indonesia, people speak a second, third languages. So you have now a very different, there's no borders uh, in this work. Um, Sorry, can I just yeah. jump in there with one, just to amplify something that Elon said. In, in areas like South America and in, in, in Lebanon and elsewhere, um, American policy often, policies that I think are effective and appropriate for, uh, for weakening Iran, particularly, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking now in terms of the sanctions arena, they look to Middle Eastern audiences, and I'm sure to diaspora audiences in, in, in South America as myopic and as um, shotgun blasts where, uh, you know, where um, uh, that, that, the da shotgun blasts that, that uh, uh, where a scalpel would be the, the, the better, uh, the, the, the better tool and they look like they're designed to dam to, to harm everyone and not just the, and, and, and not just the Iranians or, or Hezbollah and that, in order to, in, in, in order to, um, uh, minim, to diminish the larger damage to the American reputation uh, um, that these policies uh, carry, the second, sort of the collateral damage, you, you do need a, a, a serious messaging program to explain, mm -hmm. you know, as, as we did with the, I think we did rather effectively with European audiences when we first set up the, the sanctions architecture, we went there and we explained time, you know, to, to, to businesses, to governments, to publics in general, that when you do business with Iran, you're doing business with the IRGC. You don't know, you never know when you're doing, when you're, we, we, uh, that this, this uh, Iranian businessman looks like a legitimate guy, but behind him is the, uh, is, is the IRGC. And, and this is the nature of the regime. This is the nature of its, uh, of its economic institutions and its businesses. And, and that's why we have to have these policies. And the same thing is gonna be true if we, if we, if we get serious, like we're talking about, about say cutting off revenues coming from the tri-border area to, 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 to Lebanon. There are going to be a lot of Lebanese in South America who are going to be extremely unhappy with us because they don't know themselves the extent to which 
their, com their interactions with, with, uh, with their friends and family and their remittances are being, uh, are being used in part uh, for nefarious purposes by Hezbollah in Iran. Right. That's a good point. And I remember in the interview that VOA did with, um, with our Vice President, uh, Vice President Pence, mentioned a few of those things in terms of talking about, again, how we need to continue telling that story uh, and getting that out to people. Um, continue to submit your questions. If you can write them in the back, we have a couple of good ones, um, which we're going to open it up to now. First question actually is for Sitara. Um, and the question from the audience came, what is the role of women in all of this? And you know, how can women overcome censorship and repression and increase access? Uh, before I answer that, I just wanted to mention something about messaging. And uh, Ilan, you're absolutely right, because the level of access is key. And uh, I think U.S. policymakers are in a unique position to explain, the ones who are designing policy, uh, they are in a unique position to explain that to the Iranian audiences. And the messenger is as important as the message. So I'm hoping we would have more access and we have started that trend. Uh, on women, obviously, as everyone knows, they're playing a very, very important role. They have started a hijab, um, I, I guess this issue that, have, that has started uh, and it's picking up in Iran. But if I may, I'd like to talk about another issue that also involves women journalists. This is not related to the role of women in general, but this is something that we professionally, we know about that, but it's not covered in the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. Going back to what Iran is doing and pushing back against the Farsi, the Western Farsi speaking media. This is what we are facing right now. Um, the BBC, uh, Persian, our colleagues, um, they took a, an unprecedented step to take this to the United Nations and to ask them to interfere and to intervene. And I think this is a good venue to talk about that, that we all are under a lot of pressure by the Iranian government. We, I mean the Voice of America, Radio Farda, our colleagues, the BBC Persian, uh, Radio, Free, uh, Radio uh, France International and Deutsche Welle. So what the BBC lawyers did is that they uh, filed a, an official complaint uh, to the UN uh, Human Rights Commission in Geneva uh, to protect their journalists against the intimidation, death threats of uh, Iranian or Farsi-speaking journalists. And we understand that at VOA. And in March, Tony Hall, the Director General of the BBC, put out a statement and said that this is not only about the BBC. It's all Persian-speaking media outside of the country. And it's a much larger and wider issue, and it's a fundamental human rights issue that we have to deal with. Reporters Without Borders said the same thing. Now, I want to get back to the women that you were saying. We journalists are under more of attack than our male counterparts. Uh, the BBC statement specifically mentioned death threats, confiscation of passports, intimidation of, their, of the, our colleagues' relatives, but they also talked about a smear campaign against individual and especially against women journalists, spreading news about them, fake news, defamatory news about them, and so forth. So women always, they are at the forefront of whatever they do, and they are the target of the most vicious attacks by this regime. And these are dirty tactics used by the Islamic Republic of Iran because they want to stop us from doing what we're doing. Now, going back to the role of women, uh, at the very beginning of the Iranian Revolution, they were at the forefront of everything, and now they have a bigger role. And I think it's much more than the hijab protest because they're looking for more rights. Maybe the protest is just a symbol just a symbol of their rights, but they need more political participation. There are Iranian women who are graduating from universities and they are not allowed to work. There are disciplines that they cannot work in. So um, it's a very difficult situation, but uh, they are uh, voicing their concerns and we are covering them too. Right, excellent, thank you, Satara. Um, question out to both of you, Ilan and Mike. So in the context of the media environment, how can we talk about the empowerment of the Iranian people in a context of travel bans, extreme vetting of Iranians seeking travel to the U.S.? I'll start with you, maybe Mike, and then if you have some thoughts, Ilan. 
Uh, the question is sort of getting at the actions messaging, at least they're sort of saying, is there, is there any dissonance there? Um, I think that's more of a uh, that's more of a domestic American political question than than it is. I, I don't I don't believe that the truck drivers who are striking in Iran right now are re really have um, America uh, American border policies and immigration policies on their mind. Uh, I, I think it has no impact whatsoever. Whatsoever, they're really concerned about about what's going on in their own country and they're concerned about their own incomes and uh, and that's the that's the that's the nature of the game um, one of the things about about us is I think we're um, excessively fixated on our own on our own domestic d debate and we project often our, our domestic debate onto these uh, you know in, in, into into countries and we forget mm -hmm. that you know, we, we forget that we, we we forget that people abroad are not really thinking about us as much as we are. They actually think they're the center of the world, and not and, and not us. Right. And, and that's true in every country. Every country thinks it's the center of the world, and right. that we're trying to influence that system over there. Right. No, no, I I think that's absolutely right. Uh, just a, a couple of, uh, of thoughts on this. Uh, first of all, I agree completely. There, there is a. There is a personalization uh, of the American domestic political discussion uh, in a way that overlays foreign policy, and I think very unhelpfully uh, in terms of uh, more often than not, it becomes an excuse for inaction. Right. So the argument becomes, if we are saying this at home, how can we possibly say something else abroad? Right? We can never let the, so first of all, right, consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. Right. That's what the, so they say. Um, we can never allow issues that we are ironing out at home prevent us from communicating clearly what our strategic objectives are abroad. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the fact that we are having this discussion at home is actually something we should be communicating. We are having a vibrant debate over the place of minorities in our society, over the place over open borders versus closed borders. Right? Isn't that a teachable moment that we can communicate to repressive regimes that can't brook this sort of debate in their own media because it would have unintended consequences, right? To me, that's the most constructive lesson that we can take away from this. Excellent. Um, so continue to get your questions, write them down, uh, at, tweet us at bbg.gov. We'll go right here, we have a question from the audience. And if it's we can get a mic uh, here to the front. I'm Doug Fife. I'm a fellow here at Hudson. Um, I'm curious on this issue of access. What help from abroad does the Iranian government get for dealing with this, uh, the issue of uh, their firewalls, the circumvention of the firewalls, and the like? Uh, are they tapping Chinese assistance? Are they? Um, getting any help from Europe and what are the, uh, do we have the right kind of export controls in place and the right kind of export control policy f so that countries that we have good relations with are cooperating with us rather than cooperating with the Iranian government in helping it uh, to control the access of its people to the internet that's a question for Ezra, you, isn't it? <laughs> but I'm going I'm to I'm go go add, add on to it. I okay. want to add on to his question, a further question for you. It's a no, no, no. on the. On oh, yeah, the, put the me in the hot seat. Is it, are, are our own technology companies, are, 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 are their policies helping, hindering, or, or, or neutral in this question? So, so I, actually, I, I, mean, this, I think this is an excellent question. It, it's actually a very complicated one because it implicates all sorts of things. You, know, you mentioned China, for example. Uh, Z, the company ZTE, which is now the subject of active discussion on the part of the White House, is well known to have aided in this, the creation of this digital curtain in Iran. And whether or not they're held to account sends a very important signal to everybody that's working in the media space about what Iran is going to be allowed to do and what's not going to be allowed to do uh, moving forward. I would say the, the, Iran is not, uh, is not uh, an island, right? Iran is getting help uh, in, in two primary ways. The first is technology, right? And here we have to talk about China, not only, but, but China uh, significantly, in terms of uh, censorship uh, imposing technologies that have been sold to the Iranian regime. And the other avenue is access. And here, uh, again, the conversation about Latin America, the conversation about uh, the freedom of mobility that uh, Iranian 
uh, nationals, uh, including members of the IRGC, including Iranian journalists uh, who are accredited, uh, publicly accredited, but they're given a tremendous amount of latitude to move around in sympathetic countries, in countries like Ecuador and countries like Bolivia. Uh, and this facilitates that uh, expeditionary uh, public diplomacy mission that Iran is doing. So uh, on both of these fronts, and, and also on uh, whether our companies can actually uh, you know, be more circumspect, uh, do more to provide access. I think these are conversations that we need to be having. And it also, uh, like all things, right, this is an ongoing debate, uh, it's also a conversation for us to have about whether or not our government is doing enough to stop the former and facilitate the latter. And that's, I think, a conversation that hasn't been written yet. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, when we go to the next question, it's a great, great point. I would say that as someone who follows on the technology side circumvention, just to add what Elon and Mike said, is that you do see them borrowing from the Chinese and Russian playbook. So you, in the way they're targeting VPN-based technologies, um, the amount of resources they're pouring into it, they realize how important it is to, to try to um, you know, uh, censor and to try to repress the ability of that information. Because again, you have to remember, where did, this, where did the protests start? They started in the most conservative part of the country, the least, the place we think most folks would assume would never happen, right? And it's because they had access to information, so they recognize what's at stake. Um, and then this plays into the idea of why the technologies, both the circumvention technologies, being able to provide that, promote that, um, because literally, I mean, we're not talking just access information, we're talking life and death for some folks on the ground. So it's, it's a huge, uh, to me, it's a, it's a huge area of importance. I think uh, we obviously, we at BBG are, are, are very focused on that, but we are continuing to work with folks in the interagency and, and the, those in civil society to increase awareness on that. Um, good, one more question out to, um, well, yes, we'll take your question out there, right there, and we'll, we'll go to the written question. Uh, I'm Barbara Slavin from the Atlantic Council. I appreciate your remarks. Uh, and I agree with you, Mike. I don't think we know what our policy is yet, so it's kind of hard to portray it accurately. Um, I do question the notion that this administration is engaging with the Iranian people. Because of the travel ban, it's not just a domestic issue. There are many Iranian students who now say that the vetting takes so long that they can't accept uh, you know, they can't even wait for acceptances. They're going to universities in England or Australia or Canada. Instead of coming here, the numbers are way down for Iranians coming here. Um, also, the whole question of the withdrawal from the JCPOA. Um, how, I mean, it's not hard for Iran to portray itself as in the right when it has abided by this agreement and it was the United States that withdrew. So how do you overcome these obstacles? How do you present the United States uh, government as one that cares about the welfare of ordinary Iranians when people do face obstacles in coming to the United States, when sanctions are likely to hurt ordinary people more than they're going to hurt the government? And the perception is that the United States is the one that has violated the Iran nuclear deal, not Iran. Thank you. I have, a, I have a real simplistic way of thinking about these things. Um, I think that you know, when I hear slogans from the um, people on the streets of Iran who say about uh, uh, Rouhani, death to the dictator, uh, they're, they're not asking themselves, does the United States like me? Do I like the United States? They're asking themselves, What's the chance that this evil regime is going to go down? Or what's the chance that this evil regime is going to be significantly weakened? And so that's the core message that the United States needs to send, is that those people are on the decline, that their day is past, and they're, they're getting weaker, and that the suffering of the Iranian people is primarily a result of the corruption um, and venality uh, and thuggishness of those uh, of those people. Um, there are, you know, there there are certain things that I'm sure the Iranian people would like to see from the United States that the United States is not gonna is not gonna give them. But we can give them that, which is the thing that they most that that they most want. So I, I would just say more like you know, along the lines of what Elon said. We spend a lot of time thinking about what we consider to be our sins. And then assuming that because we have these sins, we can't act in the world. 
um, to the benefit of ourselves and others. And I, I, I don't think the fact that, that the fact that we're sinners or might be sinners makes any of that true. Um, and so with respect to the JCPOA, it, to me, the key question, again, is the power question, the power differential and the perception of the Iranians of the competition that's going on. Um, the most important thing there is the, is the role of the Europeans. Um, the Europeans believe as well that we, that, that, although they use this rhetoric, they haven't quite explained it, why it's a violation of international law that we left it, but it, ha it has that kind of feel for the, for, the, uh, for the Europeans. I think it's important for us to go into Europe and to explain to the Europeans a, that the Iranians themselves were in violation of the agreement. Yes, they were. B, they were, they were Barbara, they were in violation of the NPT and of the agreement. They lied on the, uh, they, they lied on the uh, 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 possible military dimensions, absolutely lied. The, the archive that the Israelis uh, took out of Iran shows that they, that they lied and showed that they've been deceiving us all along. We need to explain that to Europeans and we need to get the, Europe, the American message to European audiences, we're, we're, again, we're, we're up against a large um, obstacle here in that there was absolutely no debate in Europe, especially in Germany, but in Europe in general, about the JCPOA. That it, it, it wasn't even that the debate in the United States about the JCPOA was a, was a that the, 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 the debate in Europe was a pale shadow of the debate in the United States. There was no debate in, in Europe. The Europeans do not know the basic arguments of those of us who, the, those of us made who thought that the JCPOA was, to quote President uh, Trump, the worst uh, agreement in the history of the, of the world. The, um, we're not going to win this with the Europeans. We're, we're, we're not. But we can get, we, we can do better at getting our message uh, to them so that so that it, at least our position is, is understood better. I think that that's a worthy thing to do, but in the, end, in the end, it's a worthy thing to do in the sense that we are gonna force the Europeans to comply with our economic, to, to comply with our sanctions because of our economic power. And the question is, how are they gonna feel about it when we coerce them? Are they gonna say, okay, I kind of get it, or no, I'm really angry about it. So that's, what, that's, the, that's the margin that we're, we're playing on there. I think it's worthwhile trying to do that, but in the end, we're gonna, this is a policy of coercion, and we have to be honest with ourselves about it. So yeah, so let me, let me jump in. Um, uh, I, I agree with all that. I, I would take a slightly different tack. Um, for those of you that know me, you know that uh, I'm a recovering lawyer. Uh, they tell me it's a lifelong process, but I still do remember what I learned in law school, which is when I had professors all the time, when I would ask what would appear to be a, a completely reasonable question, and my professor would turn to me and say, that's the wrong question. Uh, so I would, I would argue, that at least on the JCPOA, it's the wrong question. It's the wrong question because it presupposes agency on the part of U.S. international media. The policy is the policy. The policy is set by policymakers. U.S. international media has to communicate the policy whether or not they like it. In fact, the fact that uh, there have been deviations in this is, was one of the things that we were looking at in our study. So, so the real question becomes, the real question becomes, how would you explain this, right? The, the, uh, whether or not you voted for this administration, whether or not uh, you support their policies, your job as a government employee, is to communicate uh, the policies and the decision-making faithfully. So how would you do that, right? So I, I think a more constructive question is, how would you communicate the decision over the JCPOA in a way that's relatable to the Iranians? I would make an argument that uh, you can use it as, as a moment of explaining American process, right? Uh, during the tail end of the negotiations in 2015, uh, before, uh, between the Obama administration and the other members of the P5 plus one and the Iranians, Gallup did a poll of American public opinion relating to the Iran deal. And that poll found that on a two to one margin, Americans opposed the deal as it was then being negotiated. And that, in part, was, what, uh, was one of the reasons why the administration proceeded to use it as an executive agreement rather than as a Senate, right? It didn't put it up for uh, Senate approval and ratification, right? Which would have required two thirds approval on the part of the Senate to make it a treaty. Instead, it used it as an executive agreement, which inherently is transient in nature. So to me, this decision 
and the hazard of hammering out a deal that is unpopular with the American people and with the US Congress uh, can result in uh, agreement that's transient, that's flimsy, that's a really good lesson to send to the Iranians. Assuming we are going to, at some point, be back at the negotiating table with them, and we may be asking for more. We may be asking for more comprehensive uh, concessions, comprehensive agreements that get more to the core of what this administration or the next one is concerned about. So to me, so again, so I, I, I think it's, that's not quite right, because it almost tilts us into the direction of saying, well, journalists that are opposed to uh, US Iran policy as it's currently constructed can just sit this one out. That may be true for certain journalists, but we're talking about US international media. I'll kick it out to Sitara uh, if you can comment on that. And also one of the questions was, how do you cover domestic Iranian news uh, and making sure it's accurate when you can and make sure that it's not being manipulated? I fully agree with what Elon was saying. We are the messenger. We are there to explain why the administration is doing what the policy is. We don't have our own opinion, and that's what we do. And I, I think, again, I fully agree with that. It's very challenging. It's very difficult because Iranians feel that allegedly they say that us journalists, we are committing a crime against national security with broadcasting what we're doing. So it makes it very difficult for people to contact us directly. But we do have our sources. Uh, we do have people who give us information. It's becoming more and more difficult. Um, especially as far as video is concerned. Um, some of our um, American um, companies that are uh, media companies, video companies that are in, in Iran, unfortunately, they're going by the censorship of Iran. And uh, for instance, we don't have access to what uh, AP has inside Iran. They said no access VOA Persian or no access BBC Persian, which is very questionable to us why they're going with that. Uh, we do have, again, our sources. We go on social media. They do give messages to us. And uh, we have a lot of user-generated videos. And this is how we covered extensively the protests, and that helped us a lot. And obviously, we have to verify everything. But if I may, I have a question for you, uh, Michael. And I wrote it down because I wanted to ask you, in your testimony on the Hill, you said that the Trump administration has announced a policy of long-term aggressive containment, not unlike the policy of the United States um, that adopted toward the Soviet Union in the Cold War. This is a very important point, and I think we should also be ready for a reaction from Iran if it goes to the same way the Soviets reacted to containment. So they jacked up their propaganda outside the country, inside the country, and they tightened the grip on information. How do you think Iran would uh, react to this containment? What would it do? They, they, have, a, they have a whole, uh, look, judging by their past behavior, they have a whole uh, menu of, of options. They'll, they can heat up the, um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, through their proxies, through, through Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. They can um, kidnap uh, Westerners, uh, American and American uh, uh, American allies, they can uh, target American soldiers in in Syria and particularly particularly in in Iraq. Um, they can work to intimidate and deny us allies on the ground in key places like uh, like Lebanon, Syria, um, uh, and 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 Iraq. You know, when last time we moved to to, to sanction. Um, to sanction banks in in Lebanon, uh, they started very in, in a very nuanced policy. Uh, Hezbollah started with threats of people of, of Lebanese who who complied with the sanctions, and then they detonated a small bomb behind a bank. Nobody died, but it was a clear sign that if you keep this up, and um, and we 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 became fearful of disorder. Right, disorder chaos in Lebanon, um, uh, and they're going to try to present any of the any of this violence that they perpetrate as caused by the escalation of Donald Trump. That's going to be the that and and they'll be they'll be messaging simultaneously our potential allies on the ground in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and and so on. They'll be. Um, they'll be messaging the American public and Western publics uh, to, to try to say, you know, it's just not worth it, and you, and, and you can't win. The, of course, the, the, um, uh, 
the, the model for all of this is the Beirut barracks bombing in, 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 in 1983, which, because there was confusion in Washington about how to push back against the, the Iranians and, uh, um, and whether putting troops and peacekeeping troops in Beirut was a smart thing or not, the minute, the minute that it got difficult, we, we, we pulled back and offered them an incredible um, and, and offered them an incredible victory. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we necessarily needed to keep the troops there, but we needed to realize who was doing this to us and why and make them pay a price for it and make, every, the, the, importantly, from the messaging point of view, not, again, this isn't the, this isn't, uh, the, the, this isn't the, um, the, uh, the journalist's job, but it's the policy ma maker's job. We have to tell everyone in the region what we're doing to respond to the uh, uh, to the Iranians. It's amazing how much how well these tools work that the, the Iranians use, like kidnapping and so on. Look how much benefit they've gotten just recently from uh, from uh, from from kidnapping. Um, we we don't we don't often in our minds because in pol for poly policymakers you're always you know concerned about the problem that is the, the problem that you're confronted with at this given moment, rather than putting it in a larger strategic framework, um, we we often don't connect up the violence, you know, the violence in Gaza, to what's going on with to what's going on with our uh, with our negotiations over the JCPOA and so on. But the Iranians are for sure. Great. Um, any more questions uh, from the crowd? All right, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to leave us as we're going to transition uh, to, to John Lansing and to get as close to your marks. Um, our discussion today reminded me of a famous um, poet of South Asia who writes a lot in Farsi, Alama Iqbal. Um, and I thought it was pretty apt when I was thinking about what Mike and Elon were saying in the discussion. And what he said was, don't get frightened by the furious, violent winds, O eagle. Don't get frightened by the furious, violent winds, O eagle. They only blow to make you fly higher. And I think that is the job and a mission of, of U.S. International Media and to do the work that we've laid out here. Um, now I turn to our fearless leader, John Lansing, who's done a great job of, of leading us through this period of change and is going to talk to us about some exciting things. So let's give a round of applause to our excellent panel here today. Well, thank you, Haroon, Mike, Ilan, and thank you, Ken Weinstein, Weinstein for the Hudson Institute. Um, as we, as Haroon mentioned earlier, we are spending a lot of time thinking about the BBG strategically and expanding from a country-based strategy to a language-based strategy. The most recent example of that was our launch last year of a 24-7 Russian language global cable network that's being distributed not just in the Russian Federation, but around the world, where there are large Russian diasporas such as uh, Jerusalem or Madrid. Uh, and the strategy there is to reach and influence Russian language speakers around the world as they seek to influence what's happening within the Russian Federation themselves. Now I get to announce today, uh, this is sort of an early announcement, uh, of the launch of a 24-7 global Farsi language channel that we're de currently developing for the launch in the first quarter of next year. So thank you. And it'll be led by Satara at the Voice of America in partnership with Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty in Prague. We'll have headquarters in London, New York, and Los Angeles, and expanding to the Middle East uh, probably the second year uh, into Dubai. Um, it'll be a 24-7 channel with all original content and acquired content, including uh, Farsi language documentaries. So what I have to show you is a little tape in English that's explaining that project, just so you can see exactly what we're working on. So if you could cue that tape up, we're ready to go. Introducing the new Global Persian Language Network, created with the resources of Voice of America and Radio Free Europe, VOA 365. We are in the show. For Iranians inside Iran and around the globe, news, analysis, 
The American story. The world story. We're here in the spirit of let's get it done. Stand by on camera one. not asking a lot from the Iranian leadership. Don't loot your people. Don't waste your people's money on these adventures in Syria and in Yemen and in Lebanon and in Iraq. States will withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal. Quality, cutting edge, unfiltered voices. VOA 365. That is a direct result of the study that Alan Berman and his team put together. Uh, we took that study very seriously. We recognized the need for more perspective, uh, for more analysis, for better production values, for more forward-leaning journalism, and Satir is the first one to, to lead the way on that. And this will be the embodiment of our response to that study, Alan. So thank you for that. And with that, I thank all of you for attending today. And Ken, once again, thanks for being our chairman. and loaning us the Hudson Institute. Thanks, everybody. Thank